The Fukushima catastrophe is probably the worst nuclear disaster in, in human history. It's certainly worse than Chernobyl. The contamination from Fukushima has gone as far south as Tokyo. Uh, I have measured it personally in air filters from cars. At least 12 different air filters from cars were sent to me, some of them from the south of Tokyo and many of them from 100 kilometers away from Fukushima. And they contain very large amounts of radioactivity in them, high, 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 high levels of cesium-134 and cesium-137. So we can conclude without any doubt that that area, up to 200 kilometers, maybe more, away from the catastrophe, catastrophe site, has been seriously contaminated with radionuclides. Now, if the cars are breathing this material, then so are the people, and so are the children. And so the children will be contaminated with radioactivity. We've recently heard that the Japanese government have been doing whole body counting, that is to say they've been putting some people inside a, a monitor to see how much cesium is inside them. And apparently the levels of cesium are sufficient for them to say that there's no problem, that there are not going to be any increases in ill health. At the same time we hear, I hear, reports from Japan, from mothers of children who say that they're showing all of the signs of contamination with cesium that were also found by my colleague Professor Yuri Bandashevsky after Chernobyl in the areas of Belarus that were contaminated similarly with this substance, cesium-137. And what it did there was that it went into the heart muscle and it caused conduction difficulties and destroyed heart, heart muscle. So the children in, in, uh, in Belarus were suffering heart attacks and arrhythmias. That's when the heart doesn't beat properly. And of course, later on in life, they die young from heart disease because the heart cells don't replicate themselves. The heart cells, you get all of your heart cells at once. You get maybe 1% uh, increase in heart cells per year. But over the period of time we're talking about, there's going to be no replacement for the cells that were damaged by the Fukushima catastrophe in the children. So we have two different points of view here. We have the point of view of the Japanese government, who are ignoring it, who are making these superficial measurements of cesium in the, in, in, in the whole bodies of the children and the people, and are saying that these concentrations are not sufficient to, to cause any, any problems. Well, of course, this is an argument that's going on and on. It's like a tennis match, goes backwards and forwards. You know, the, the, the independent scientists say there's a problem, and the government and the nuclear scientists say there's no problem. Of course, the real problem is that we have to do something about it. I mean, I, I am a father. I, I have seven children. I have 11 grandchildren. And I can't sit back and just let this go on with us in some sort of silly tennis match between us and the nu pro-nuclear scientists who are trying to save the industry from collapse. Uh, and all the time, the children are getting more and more sick, and, and, they're, and, and they're building up this level of radioactive damage, which will result in them getting sick and dying with cancer, heart disease, whole range of, of, Ill, of illnesses that were all discovered after Chernobyl. And it's not as if this is something new. We know what's going to happen. We absolutely know what's going to happen. We have looked very closely at the health effects of people who were exposed to these same radionuclides after the Chernobyl accident in the same quantities. Not as many people, I have to say, which is why Fukushima is a worse disaster so I decided we had to do something and I contacted, or I was contacted by some people in Japan who said what can we do? So instead of just moaning about it, we decided to do something. Now there are actually some things that we can do. The first thing we can do is we can actually measure the radionuclides ourselves because frankly we do not believe what the Japanese government is coming out with. We don't think that they're right. I mean I've measured more radioactivity in a car air filter than they are measuring in a child. And the car breathes air in the same way as the child breathes air, so I don't really believe what they're saying. That's the first point. So we need to have independent testing. And secondly, we need to try and do something about these children who are being contaminated. There are two things we can do. The first thing is we can take them away from the areas of contamination and put them somewhere where it's reasonably safe. But that, re that, that leads us to another problem, because what's happening now, as I'm told, is that the Japanese government are trucking radioactive material from the Fukushima disaster area, where it's contaminated, all over Japan. 
And even as far south as the south of Japan, we're now getting reports of, of uh, radioactivity radioactive material being taken all the way to the south of Japan to be burned. Now what possible reason could there be for burning it as far away as that? I'll tell you the reason. It's really quite sinister and horrifying. The reason is this, that eventually when these children start to die from leukemia, from other cancers, from heart disease, from whatever, their parents are going to want to go into court. They're going to want to sue the Japanese government and they're going to want to have to say these, in order to do that, these children were contaminated and that's why they've got high levels of cancer. But of course, the only way that they can say that they've got high levels of cancer is to have a control group in an area that's not contaminated. For example, the south of Japan. So I believe that the project to take this material and burn it all over Japan is to destroy all of Japan. It's to increase the, the, the cancer rate in the whole of Japan so that there will be no control group to which you can compare these children in the Fukushima area. So that's that point. So we want to take the children away anyway into some safe area. That's, that's, the, that, that's what we want to do. But the second thing that we can do, and this is also quite important, is we can try and block the material. We can try and block the absorption of the cesium and the absorption of the strontium-90 and the plutonium and the other substances that are not being measured, incidentally. We have to wait a minute now because there's a train passing. I'm sitting on a children's playground here in um, Sweden. This is in Stockholm. And I decided to talk to you from here, from Stockholm, where there is a significant amount of radioactivity as well, I have to say, in the, in the Baltic Sea. I measured this myself, but that's another question. So the second thing we can do is we can try and block the ingress of the radioactivity into the child's body. Now we know that we can do this with iodine because iodine goes to the thyroid gland. We give them stable iodine, or at least we're supposed to. It turns out the Japanese government didn't. Um, and then it stops the bad iodine, the radioactive iodine, from binding to the same sites. And this, you can do the same thing with the other radionuclides. For uranium and plutonium and strontium-90, which are the most serious, and all of which they're not measuring, incidentally, and none of which can be measured with a whole body counter because they're alpha emitters or beta emitters, we can block that attachment to the DNA by giving large amounts of calcium and magnesium which binds to the DNA and keeps the, the, the strontium and the uranium off the DNA. So that's one thing that these children can do. They can take a tablet every day of stable calcium. And so we are going to produce tablets which contain stable calcium which we, cause, which we will supply cheaply at the cost of production to parents of these children so that they can take these tablets and block the ingress of, of these substances. And we're also working on another tablet which will block the ingress of cesium-137. Now in order to do this, we have set up a, an organization in Japan called the Christopher Busby Foundation for the Children of Fukushima. And it has a website and it's all in Japanese and it's all being done by a colleague of mine who contacted me from Japan called James, called James Grand. Uh, in addition to this, we are going to purchase a large number of highly sophisticated radiation measuring devices for, uh, from Europe, from suppliers in Europe and, and suppliers in the Ukraine. And we're going to make these um, devices available to the parents of children to measure the concentrations of these substances in the food and also to supermarkets and we will measure the substances ourselves. We will set up a laboratory in, 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 in Japan so that people can bring these substances to the laboratory and find out the truth about the concentration of radionuclides in these substances. So these are the things that we want to do and we want you to help us to do this in any way that you can. This is an operation to save the children of Fukushima because we do not believe that the Japanese government is doing anything to save the children of Fukushima. They are operating on a principle which is the principle of saving not the children of Fukushima but the international nuclear industry. And this is disgraceful. Thank you for listening. Christopher Busby, I'm a, a, an expert on the health effects of ionizing radiation and I want to talk to you about um, Fukushima and Chernobyl. Um, what I want to say is 
about uh, is, is, to, is that uh, the, the models that are used to determine the effects of radiation always concentrate on cancer and leukemia. And so the current risk model will say how many cancers are expected after Fukushima and how many cancers were expected after Chernobyl and so forth. But we know from Chernobyl that radiation causes a whole range of diseases and, and one of the diseases that it seems to cause is heart disease. I want to talk to you about heart disease effects in children. Now, a colleague of mine, Professor Yuri Bandashevsky, uh, became quite famous um, because he studied the effects of cesium-137 exposure to children in the areas that were contaminated by, um, by the Chernobyl accident in Belarus. Uh, he discovered, uh, in the late 90s, he discovered um, that the children who were contaminated to the extent of having a, only 20 to 30 becquerels per kilogram, which is not very much, of cesium-137, were suffering cardiac arrhythmias, that, that that's, uh, the, the heart wasn't, wasn't beating properly, um, and they were suffering heart attacks and dying. And it's a very serious matter. So it wasn't a question of leukemia and cancer in these children, although that occurred as well, but there were very high rates of heart disease in these children. So the children were manifesting um, heart diseases which are normally only found in old people. And this got me thinking about how this could be at, at what appears to be quite a low level of contamination. So I started looking into this and what I found is truly extraordinary, which I shall share it with you. The, the, the heart of a child is, is um, at the age of about two, or, uh, uh, two to five is, quite, is, is, is about this size, and at, at the age of about ten it's about this size. And we know from measurements that have been made how many cells there are in the heart of a child. A five-year-old child has a, has a heart which is approximately 220 grams in weight. Uh, a lot of it, of course, is, is blood. So if you take the blood out and just you leave the muscle tissue, there's about 85 grams of muscle tissue in, in the heart of a child aged five. This is all data. Now, we actually know also the size of, of, of the, heart, um, the heart muscle cells. So we know how many heart muscle cells there are. In, in a child's heart. There are, about, there are about 3 billion muscle cells in a child's heart. So this is a number, 3 billion. And what we can do is we can put 50 becquerels per kilogram of cesium in a thought experiment. We can put it into this heart muscle. And a becquerel uh, is one disintegration per second. So we can see how many disintegrations, uh, that's how many electron tracks uh, come from, from this cesium-137 in a period of about a year. And when we do this sum, and it's really simple, it can be done on the back of an envelope, what we find is that there are many, many more electron tracks tra traversing the cells than you can imagine. And in fact, it works out that if only 1% of those cells were, da were, were killed by the electron tracks from that level of cesium-137, if only 1% were killed, you would lose 25% of all the muscle cells in the heart. This is very serious because the heart is an extraordinary organ. The muscle cells in the heart are autonomous. They just contract and they contract and they contract for the whole period of the life of the individual. And every day they pump 7,000 litres of blood through the body. Truly extraordinary. And we live for 70 years. So this heart beats away continuously for the whole of your lifespan. But of course these cells are non-replaceable by and large. It turns out that, that, that only 1% of these cells can be replaced in a year. So if these cells get damaged, or if a particular number of these cells get damaged, they cannot be replaced in a short period of time. So, so a year's exposure to 50 becquerels per kilogram of cesium-137, and incidentally, uh, cesium-137, we know from experiments, binds to muscle. So this is where it goes, just like iodine goes into the thyroid gland, and strontium goes into the bone and it goes to the DNA. Cesium-137 goes to muscle, so it will concentrate in the muscle tissue of the heart. So this child's heart, after one year of, of, of exposure to that level of cesium, which is quite a small level, will have approximately 25% of its cells destroyed. Now, we would therefore expect to find effects, and the same effects that were found by Bandashevsky. And it does seem, from, from what people have been telling me about children in, in the Fukushima-affected area, that they are actually suffering heart attacks. So, 
There are two things that follow from this, which are terribly important. The first thing is that children in that area should immediately be scanned using ECG, electrocardiograms. All hospitals have these devices to see whether they have conduction problems because, because the first manifestation of this damage to the heart muscle cell will be conduction problems which can be shown on these ECGs and in fact this is how Bandashevsky uh, found this and incidentally Bandashevsky when he reported this was sent to jail and uh, the, the government wouldn't believe it and they said he was scaremongering and so they sent him to jail he was in jail for several years until eventually Amnesty International and the European Commission, the European Parliament uh, issued him with an international passport, one of only 25 that had ever been issued, and got him out of jail. So I worked quite closely with Bandashevsky, who was a hero. He, he received the Edward P. Radford Memorial Prize for Radiation uh, Biology uh, at the, the Lesbos Conference, um, where he gave this paper that, that showed that these in, there were these increases in the, in the heart disease in the children. So the first thing that has to be done is that the children have to be checked out for conduction problems with an ECG. Evacuated. And if, if yes, and, the, and of course, if any of them are suffering from these problems, they should be immediately evacuated. But if they, any of them are suffering from these problems, then all of the children should be evacuated because it means that there will be subclinical effects from this cesium-137 in heart muscle. And it will not be repaired. Heart cannot be repaired. Heart tissue cannot be repaired. These children will suffer for the whole of their life and will die young. Which brings me to the second point. The second point is this, is that if you die from heart attack or heart disease, you will not die from cancer. Because cancer is essentially a disease of old, pe old people. So you get genetic damage and it goes on and on and on. Eventually you get cancer. By and large, what happens is that the cancer rates go up very sharply as you get old. But I can tell you this, that the heart disease effects go up very much more quickly. So what you will find in areas like Fukushima that are contaminated with these radionuclides is not necessarily an enormous increase in cancer. There will be an increase in cancer, but you will find a big increase in heart disease. And actually what we look, when we look at Belarus, we find both of those things. We find an increase in cancer, but we find a big increase in heart disease, an enormous increase in heart disease. And as a result of this, the demogra demographic index of the Republic of Belarus has fallen sharply after the Chernobyl accident and now has gone into negative replacement. So in fact if it goes on like this the, the, the population of Belarus will disappear. And this is what we will expect to see in Fukushima. So I'm warning you all now to start looking out for heart disease, heart attacks and keep getting the children out of there quickly. This is all simple stuff. You can do these calculations and I've done these calculations and I've produced a report which will be put on the internet shortly and that you can, you can have a look at. And we have also, the European Committee on Radiation Risk has also released early the Bandashevsky paper that he gave at the Lesbos Conference, and that is on the website of the European Committee on, of, of Radiation Risk, which is www.euradcom.org, E-U-R-A-D-C-O-M. So thank you for listening. I'm talking you to, to you today on Hiroshima Day, about the question of human rights, science and the law. And in this I'm representing a new committee called the International Committee on Nuclear Justice, which was launched in Vilnius uh, in December 2011, and later was added to by people from Geneva in May 2012. The purpose of this committee is to carry out and research um, legal avenues of preventing the continuing contamination of the environment by the nuclear industry and by weapons usage. And the first thing that, that we are launching today is um, a petition to the European Parliament which is based on human rights legislation and it's based on the fact that there is an enormous amount of information available now, uh, peer-reviewed literature, scientific papers which show that the contamination of the environment is causing the deaths of millions of people. And up till now, nobody has really thought about ways in which they can legally stop the nuclear industry and the um, military from continuing to contaminate the environment, because whenever they try to do this, activists and NGOs, and there are enough of those, and I'm talking to you all now, they get blocked by the argument that the risk model, the International Commission on Radiological Protection risk model, 
shows that these contaminations are safe and cannot possibly harm anybody. But there is now enough evidence to show that this is wrong. Scientific evidence in the peer review literature and in the document that I should be sending you, and which you can find on the website of the International Commit Committee on Nuclear Justice, which is nuclearjustice.org, you will find this document, which is a template for a petition to the European Parliament, which I will now explain. Now, this actually only applies to people who live in the states of the European Union. And later on, we will be dealing with people who live in other countries, like Japan and the United States, countries which have signed up to various international conventions on human rights, and we will be using human rights legislation. But for now, the first um, launch of this, uh, this idea will be through a petition to the Petitions Committee of the European Parliament, which I will now explain. You will find this petition uh, on the website, as I said, of the International Commission on Nuclear Justice. And what I want you to do is to download the petition and to sign it and if you like to add to it anything that you, you have that concerns you about the particular situation in your country, um, about nuclear industry, about contamination, possibly about child health, whatever it happens to be that, that is your concern, add that to the petition, sign it, and send it by registered post to the Petitions Committee of the European Parliament at Rouvier's in Brussels, and we'll put the address up for you to do this. Now, I talked about this in Geneva, and I said there, when people were concerned about what could be done, that there was something that could be done. And if you all do this, it will cause a tsunami of petitions to appear. In August, and this is important because in August the, the European Parliament is in recess, and, and these petitions will have to just build up in the Petitions Committee, and they will have to deal with them. And the reason that they will have to deal with them is this that the petition is based on the present European Parliament, the present, the present European law, which is a directive uh, uh, based on the Euratom Treaty. It's the Euratom 9629 Directive, which is called the Basic Safety Standards Directive. Inside this directive is a clause, and I'll show you the clause here. It, it, it's, it's written down. Uh, under, under Chapter 5, Justification and regulatory control of practices, and we're talking about practices involving the release of radioactivity to the environment, Article 20 says, existing types of practices shall be reviewed as to their justification whenever new and important evidence about their efficacy or potential consequences is acquired. Now this is a terribly important clause, because what it means is that all of the practices, that's every situation where radioactivity is released to the environment has to be reconsidered on the basis of evidence that shows that the risk model that is currently being used to address this practice, and this is the risk model of the ICRP, if it shows that this risk model is wrong or raises questions about its safety, then these practices have to be re-justified. And this petition will force that to come about because it is law. So it's not just a question of complaining to your MP it's not just a question of writing something saying, oh, I don't like this, on some vast tsunami of postcards that go to somebody who just puts them in the bin. This is a legal process which has to be dealt with, and they will have to deal with it. But only if you send the petition along. Now, let me explain what this is about. Under... Under um, international human rights agreements and legislations. There are various clauses which say that each person is entitled to live in an environment which is safe for their health. This has been universally signed up to by every single country in the world, and certainly by the European Union. Now the problem is that people who live environments that, in environments that are contaminated with radioactivity are not living in an environment which is safe for their health. And so this is a contravention of an international human rights legislation agreement. And the only reason that they can say, this is, that the, this is the European Union, the Commission, in this particular case, that these things are harmless, is they can say that the International Commission on Radiological Protection says that, 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 these, that the doses that are associated with these exposures are too low to cause any effects. But in this petition, at the end of it, we have gathered together 55 peer-reviewed references, each of which on its own 
shows that the ICRB risk model is false. And not false by a very small amount, but false by a very, very large amount. So that thousands of people are dying, no, millions of people are dying as a result of these exposures. People are living along the shores of the Baltic Sea, people who are living along the shores of the Irish Sea, children who are leaving, living near nuclear installations. There's a long, long list. People in Iraq that have been exposed to radioactivity from uranium. I'll just go through a few of these because I don't want to hold you too long. The most important thing is this take-home message. You must get this petition, download it, and sign it and send it to the European Parliament at the address that we'll give you. So I'll just go briefly through some of the evidences, and they're all backed up by peer-reviewed studies. Firstly, there's childhood cancer near nuclear installations. An enormous number of studies have shown that if you live within five kilometers of a nuclear power station, your children have double the risk of getting childhood leukemia. There's no question about this. The radiation causes the childhood leukemia, and yet the ICRP risk model says that this is impossible. And the, the error in the model needed to account for these childhood leukemias, and the latest study is an enormous study from the German government. The error necessary to explain this is upwards of a thousand times. So in other words, the risk model of the ICRP is wrong by at least one thousand times in terms of, it, 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 with regard to this particular situation. And now also here's another thing. There was an increase in infant leukemia after Chernobyl in those children who were in the womb at the time of the Chernobyl radiation. So it could only be the Chernobyl radiation that caused the increase in infant leukemia. And the, these uh, uh, studies were done in a number of different epidemiological settings, in Greece, in Germany, in the United Kingdom, in the United States, in Belarus. Wherever anybody looked, they found increases in infant leukemia in these children who were in the womb. And that shows an error in the ICRP risk model of about 400 times. Then there was a study in northern Sweden by Martin Tondell uh, that showed that people who lived in areas contaminated with cesium from Chernobyl had, had cancer rates proportional to the amount of contamination. This was published in the peer review literature. It's there for anyone to see. It shows that the error in the ICRP risk model is about 600 times. A very important study now is one by Hagen Scherb in Germany, and he looked at, the, and his colleague Christina Voigt looked at the sex ratio, that's the ratio of boys to girls who were born after particular accidents like Chernobyl, after the weapons testing fallout, and living near nuclear power stations, and he found that there was a perturbation in the sex ratio, quite clear, highly statistically significant, published in the peer review literature. It means that millions of children have died. Millions of children have died as a result of these exposures to, 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 to ionizing radiation. Shows another, that shows a problem with the ICRP risk model of hundreds of times, thousands of times. In fact, the ICRP risk model doesn't even consider the effects on, on, on infant mortality and, ch and children. So, we have cancer and, and leukemia, lymphoma and heart disease in uranium workers. Very recent study by Irina Gusevacano, in, in, who works for the French nuclear industry, incidentally. So not somebody from the, if you like, the lefty side, somebody who works for the industry. Very clever epidemiologists have studied uranium workers and shown that they have a huge increase in heart, heart disease effects and in cancer, in leukemia and lymphoma. This shows that the ICRP risk model is out by a factor of 2,400 times in the peer review literature. Various other things. I won't go through all of them. They're all on the end of this report. I'll just finally mention, of course, the work done by my colleague Alexey Yablokov, who collected together all of the information that came out from the ex-Soviet Union territories contaminated by Chernobyl, and showed that there were enormous health disaster effects in, in Belarus, in uh, Ukraine, in, in those parts of the Russian Federation that were exposed to the Chernobyl effects in Bryansk. There is just so much evidence, we have an embarrassment of riches, but the problem is that nobody will look at it. Well, we're going to force them to look at it by sending this petition to the European Parliament Petitions Committee, with all of its 55 references, and you are going to help us to do this by contacting us at info at nuclearjustice.org, uh, or else just going to the website and downloading the, the uh, information. And I hope that you will contact us and tell us that you're doing it. So we'll have a sort of a list of the number of people who have helped us in this way.
for the first time, we can probably make a difference. We can probably really stop the nuclear industry from, for, from continuing to pollute. And, and I don't blame these people. I have to say that we're, we're not talking about bad guys and good guys here, although actually there are some bad guys. I think in general we're talking about ignorance and uh, people who are tied into a sort of culture of physics and a culture of the past, a culture of a risk model that was set up in 1952 and hasn't really been altered since then. And so we have to forgive these people for what they've done, but we cannot continue to allow them to do it. Thank you.